Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Under the Heat Seminar. Today we have my dear friend Blake Medill, who's going to tell us about an algebra proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Blake, take it away. Thank you very much, Parker. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you all for being here. I am reasonably under the weather at the moment. I was just telling Parker I switched all my classes today to be online. So it's a big online teaching day. Uh, do forgive my voice if it starts to kind of wear out a little bit as the uh, as the talk goes on. But as they say, the show must go on. So as Parker noted, I'm going to talk to you today about an algebraic proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. And now before I begin, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. I am not going to assume you know any abstract algebra. I am going to assume you know some basic linear algebra. All right. And uh, what I'm going to do as I go uh, throughout the talk is I will introduce you to some abstract algebraic ideas. But my job or my goal here is not to prove every single detail. I will give you some of the results, often cute counting arguments that actually are big deals in the world of abstract algebra, and we'll see how we can use them in the light of the fundamental theorem of algebra. And so that's kind of my stance, and that's what I hope this, uh, this talk achieves. All right, so first things first, the fundamental theorem of algebra, FTA for short, simply says that a non-constant complex polynomial, that is, a polynomial with complex coefficients must have a root in C. So you can always find a root of a non-constant complex polynomial. Cx here is our notation for polynomials in the indeterminate x with coefficients from C. Now, you may have seen a different version of the fundamental theorem of algebra, and that is that every non-constant complex polynomial can be completely factored down into linear terms. I just want to note that these two are indeed equivalent, because if you can keep finding a root, you can keep dragging out a linear term, x minus z, and do that over and over and over again until you've completely broken down the polynomial into linear terms. And so this is an often stated, rarely proved theorem, all right, that I want to address a little bit today. The most common places you'll see this come up, I'd say the most common place this comes up proof-wise is in a complex analysis course where some uh, basic integration, contour integration uh, type theory is used to prove this result. And there also exists algebraic uh, topology proofs out there as well. That's great, but as an algebraist, so right now I'm a lecturer, I'm teaching stream. Uh, in fact, I've mostly been teaching analysis as of late, but at my heart, I am an algebraist. I did my PhD in non-commutative ring theory. And so it feels bad to me that the two main proofs of the fundamental theorem of algebra come from analysis. And so one of my uh, favorite proofs the one I'm going to talk to you about today is an algebraic proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra, and so justice for algebra, if you will. So let's uh, let's do a little bit of a setup before we uh, begin. And I should say, if there are ever any questions, don't be afraid to uh, interrupt me. I don't mind. Okay. So the goal is to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra using algebra. All right. And now I need to be honest. All right. While we're not going to use any heavy analysis like contour integration, we are going to steal a little bit of calculus. Namely, if you have a polynomial over the real numbers and it has odd degree, then it must have a root in the real numbers, i.e. a real root. And why is this calculus? Why is an odd degree polynomial having a real root calculus? It's a simple application of the intermediate value theorem. For an odd degree polynomial, the leading term is going to totally control, at least eventually, the sign of the polynomial when you plug in a specific number. All right. And so on one hand, uh, let's assume, say, the uh, leading coefficient of your polynomial is uh, positive. Then for a super large negative number, the polynomial will give you a negative number. For a super large positive number, the polynomial will give you a positive number when you put in that number, that is. And so by the intermediate value theorem, you have to cross zero eventually. 
And so, yes, technically calculus is analysis, but this isn't what I call heavy analysis. This is light analysis. We can handle the intermediate value theorem even in algebra. And so it's not completely analysis free, but exactly. And in the quotes that uh, we have analysis in quotation marks, I completely agree. So there's me being honest. Now, here are the tools of the trade. I'm not going to define these precisely, but I'm going to give you all the core ideas you need. So first, we're going to talk, what, talk about what is a field K. A field K is a set with two operations, addition and multiplication. And all this notation means is that you can take two things in K and add them, and you can take two things in K and multiply them, where the operations satisfy some nice or usual axioms. All right, things like A plus B equals B plus A. A times B equals B times A. A times B plus C, you do the distributive thing like you're used to doing in the real numbers. But where we have one more property, all right, every non-zero element is multiplicatively invertible. That is, as long as A is non-zero, you can find a B, which you might want to call A inverse, so that A times B equals one. And so if that is too abstract for you, just remember that Q, R, and C have been fields all along, and you're used to working in them. You're used to working with their addition, their multiplication, and inverting every element. One collection with two nice operations, plus and multiply, is the integer z. But it, of course, is not a field. Why? Because, for instance, one half is not an integer. And so our friend two is not invertible, all right? And so this is not a field. I want to, before I ask for uh, questions, I'm just going to, uh, to move to kind of our next main tool. And that is the idea of an automorphism. So let's say we have F contained in K where they're both fields. And I'm only going to say, pardon me, I'm only going to say this once, and we'll assume it for the rest of the talk. Whenever we say F and K are fields, and F is a subset of K, we're going to assume they have the same operations. All right, so K, the big field, has its operations. F is stealing the operations from K, and it's being a field in its own right. All right, so it's borrowing the operations from K. It just might be a little bit smaller. Now, an automorphism of k is an invertible function, phi from k to k, which works really nicely with addition and works really nicely with multiplication. Namely, I like to say it preserves the addition and it preserves the multiplication. And the lazy quantifier that's missing here is that this is true for all x and y in k. So an additive and multiplicative function, if you will. And if phi is an automorphism, an invertible function that does the right thing with addition and multiplication, we say it belongs to ought k. And just for later, we will consider in this talk special automorphisms called Galois automorphisms, which I uh, denote the collection of by gal k over f. And these are just the automorphisms of k, which fix every single element of f. For every x and f, the automorphism leaves it alone. Phi of x equals x. So field, automorphism, Galois automorphism. These are kind of the three objects we're going to be working with a lot in this talk. Can I answer any questions at the moment? Are there any questions or comments? Uh, okay. So, okay, could you give could you give some examples of Galois things? Absolutely. Like, so, uh, abstract really fast. Let me get a new slide here for you. All right, let's take my favorite field, and we will. Uh, you can trust me that this is a field for now. Let's say K is what I call Q adjoin root two, which is the set of all A plus B root two, where A and B are uh, rational numbers. 
All right. And now consider, so this is a field. You can trust me on that one. Okay. Now, what would be an example of a Galois uh, automorphism? Well, let's take phi, for instance, which maps a plus b root 2 to a minus b root 2. Yes, it changes. Sorry, one too many brackets. It does change the element. It changes that plus into a minus. But notice, if there was no b term here, this change of sign would not actually matter at all. All right. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that phi is an element of gal k over q. It fixes q. And in fact, automorphisms have to fix q. But that's a, a less obvious fact. It's easy to see that this is true for this one particular example. Changes up the elements. All right. But leaves a totally alone when a is just by itself that is when you only have a rational number so there would be an example of this kind of object sweet thank you you're welcome okay there's a bunch of abstract mumbo jumbo right three big tools we're going to be working a lot with but if this is going to be what i hope is an okay talk let alone a good talk we need to talk about why we care about those things sure we can write them down but who cares well Let's say F is contained in K and they are fields. Now, let's say alpha is in K and F of X is a polynomial over F. So again, F square brackets X just means F is a polynomial with coefficients in F. And let's suppose alpha is a root of F. What can we say and what can we do? Well, take a look at this. Let's say f of x equals uh, a to the n, x to the n, plus all the way to a1x plus a0, where each of the ai's are the coefficients, and we know they live in f. So what do we have? We have that alpha is a root. So a n alpha to the n, plus all the way to a1 alpha, plus a0, that's 0. We said alpha is a root, so I plugged in alpha, and I know I have to get zero. But who cares about these weird automorphisms? Say we took phi to be a Galois automorphism of k over f. Okay, first things first, let's look at the following. Number one, look at this handy little trick. Phi of zero equals phi of zero plus zero, which is, remember, it's an automorphism, so it knows what to do with addition. This is 5, 0 plus 5, 0. And assuming the axioms that we never actually stated give us a 0 and allow us to do usual things you're used to doing, all right, then we would cancel out and we conclude that 5, 0 equals 0. And indeed, that is true. All right. And 2. All right, now that we have 5, 0 is 0, let's apply 0 equals 5, 0. Okay, fine, I just said that. Why am I doing it again? Well, 0 is also equal to this expression, a n alpha to the n plus a1 alpha plus a0. And now we break up phi over the addition and the multiplication, which it likes to do because it's that automorphism. And we see this is equal to a n phi of alpha to the n plus all the way to a one phi of alpha plus a alpha a zero pardon me and notice those coefficients got left alone because phi fixes everything in f and so secretly what i use there is that phi of a i equals a i and so that's why the coefficients came out unharmed the galois automorphism does not harm them. And so what's the punchline, folks? The punchline is that this means f of phi of alpha is also zero. So if alpha is a root, so is phi of alpha. And so what are Galois automorphisms good for? They are good from going from one root to another. If you care about roots of polynomials, which is a very fundamental math thing to care about, 
All right. These are your, uh, if you like your, these are your bridges. These are your stepping stones that allow you to jump from one to the other. These are our way of scrambling the roots, if you like, of a polynomial. And so mumbo jumbo at first, now very useful tools for talking about roots of polynomials. That's what I'm talking about. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Let me uh, switch back to uh, white markers so that the talk's not so intense. All red, I would seem angry, right? All right, let's proceed. All right, we're going to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra, and we're going to break it into steps. We have all the preliminary tools we need. So step one to this proof is to set up the contradiction. So let's suppose we can find a polynomial f of x in the complex numbers. Sorry, let me use highlighter a polynomial f of x in the complex numbers of minimal degree such that f of x has no roots in c. Okay, and now I'm being a little sloppy at one step. Technically, when I say minimal degree, I do mean minimal positive degree because yes, f of x equals seven does have no roots, but I don't care about constant polynomials. They're not very interesting. So I mean minimal positive degree. If I can find a polynomial with no roots in C, I can definitely find a minimal one. Take one of smallest degree. And note that f of x in this case is going to be irreducible, meaning you can't factor it down any further. Because if you could factor it down any further, then the terms you factored it into could not have any roots either, because then f would have roots. But we said f does not. All right. And so take a small polynomial with no roots, assuming one exists. All right. And hopefully we'll get a contradiction one day. Now, our first abstract algebra fact is that you can construct a field. Let me switch up the color. You can construct a field L, which contains the complex numbers, such that f of x has a root alpha in L. And there are formal uh, processes for constructing such a thing. But what I want you to know is that it is possible to take a field and start throwing in more elements until a polynomial which didn't have a root before actually does now have a root. Okay, it's things like, um, uh, like uh, say x squared plus one in the real numbers. No root, no root in the real numbers. But as soon as you introduce the magical i in C, suddenly it does have a root. As it turns out, stated as fact, this process is generalizable. All right, and so we will take that there is some alpha living above the complex numbers where my polynomial all of a sudden does have a root. But f of x has no complex roots, and so we know it's definitely properly above c. It's not actually living in c. All right, and quick step two. Now that we have an alpha, make that field. Yes, we had L, but I want to keep it a little bit uh, simpler. And the idea is very similar to uh, what we did in our Q-adjoin root 2 example. We can consider what I call C-adjoin alpha, and it is just all G of alpha, where G of X is a complex polynomial. So all things of the form a n alpha to the n plus a n minus one alpha to the n minus one, et cetera, where you're taking your coefficients to be complex. Turns out this is a field, and this is, has nothing to do with uh, the complex numbers. This is something you can do in general. In case that is too abstract, let me do a concrete example, and I'm going to use the rational numbers. Why aren't I going to use the complex numbers? Well, it turns out I can't actually find a polynomial which has no roots <laughs> by the fundamental theorem of algebra, but we're trying to prove that. So we better not uh, dance around that too much. So take a look at alpha, which is the square root of two plus root two. Well, what happens? What happens if we take alpha squared minus two and we square it? Alpha squared minus two, you can see, is just root two. And so this is equal to two. Rearranging, we see that alpha to the four minus four alpha squared. All right, now plus four minus two. So plus two equals 
zero. Okay, that's fine. And we see that alpha is a root of this polynomial. But well, here's what I really want us to notice. Alpha to the four equals four alpha squared minus two, just by doing a little bit of naive algebra. So what's important here? When you are considering polynomials evaluated at alpha, we now know there is never a need for any power higher than three to be appearing. Why? Because you can always turn alpha to the four into something only involving alpha squared and a constant. And so, in fact, generalizing the uh, construction we just made in step two, we could form Q adjoin alpha, which is just all G of alpha, where G of X is a rational polynomial. And now we've simplified it, and we now know it's just going to look like A plus B alpha plus C alpha squared plus D alpha cubed, where all of the A, B, C, and D are rational. I don't have to look at all polynomials. I can just look at cubics, all right, because I can always turn alpha to the four into something involving lower powers. Does that make sense? And are there any questions? Do you see how we can simplify the construction we just made when alpha just so happens to be a root of a polynomial? There's, there's some nodding happening over here, but it's hard to pick up over the microphone. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, not yeah, louder. <laughs> not, not louder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, step three. Let's get dimensional a little bit. Dimensional in a linear algebraic way. So back to our proof. Remember, f of x is our polynomial. Complex numbers, minimal degree, irreducibility, doesn't have any complex roots. All right. Well, we have f of alpha is zero. So just, just, just like in the example we just did, c adjoin alpha can be written in the following way, where we only have to go up to alpha to the n minus one, because I can always turn alpha to the n into lower degree things. This is just the abstract generalization of what we just saw in an example. So a nice concrete description now for C adjoin alpha, much more concrete than just G of alpha for all polynomials G. And now here's the thing, by minimality, Alpha can't be a root of a smaller polynomial. Alpha can't be a root of a smaller polynomial. We pick the smallest one. Okay. And so what does that tell me? It tells me that one alpha up to alpha to the n minus one is actually linearly independent over C. And so the dimension of C adjoin alpha as a C vector space is n, which is just the degree of the polynomial. Since f was the smallest degree polynomial we could find with alpha as a root, all right, then there can't be any dependence relation amongst one through alpha to the n minus one, because that would give me a smaller polynomial having alpha as a root. Okay, so that's the dimension of these very particular constructions. And just for notation, we are going to use this square bracket notation, C adjoin alpha over C, to denote that dimension. It's just a little bit easier to work with. So we got dimensional. We computed a dimension of a vector space. And what we need to do is we need to take that inspiration and generalize it just a little bit. All right. Well, let's say F is, F is a field contained in K. Then basically what we've just used is that K is an F vector space a vector space with field of scalars f. Because remember, k has an addition and it has a multiplication. You're allowed to multiply any two things in k. But in particular, if you want to take something in f with something in k, that is restricting your general multiplication into something that looks an awful lot like scalar multiplication, that thing you do in linear algebra. All right, so by taking k's addition, and throwing away half of its multiplication and only allowing the first thing to be from f, 
you exactly get scalar multiplication and you get a vector space. And we use the K over F notation in square brackets to denote the dimension of that vector space. And the second fact we will use, or maybe third, I'm gonna stop counting. All right, is that dimension is very multiplicative. Namely, if you have F contained in K, contained in L, all fields, then the dimension of L over F is the dimension of L over K times the dimension of K over F. I've seen this called the tower theorem, ladder theorem. All right, it just tells you that dimension works in a very nice multiplicative way. And if you want to assume uh, L over F is finite dimensional as to not talk about infinite dimensional vector spaces, you can totally go ahead and do that. Okay, let me pause for questions. I don't wanna leave anyone behind. Can I help with anything? Okay. All right, so let us do a little bit more now. Suppose the dimension of K over F is N. So it's an N dimensional F vector space. Now for alpha and K, what do we know about the list one alpha up to alpha to the N? First of all, how many things are in that ordered list? There are N plus one. We exactly, Alex. And so Alex, I'll throw it back to you. What do you know about that set with n plus one things? Uh, it's a in basis n, for that. It's a basis. It has n plus one things. Could it be a basis? The oh, it could be. N. It couldn't be a basis. That's right. Because the dimension it's too n. darn big. So what yeah. must it be? Uh, it must just be a linearly independent, uh, independent set. So it spans the space. Dependent. 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 Yes. It might span a space, but there's redundancy. This yeah. must be linearly dependent because for a linearly independent set, you can always extend it to a basis, right? And so this set's way too big to be linearly independent. It's already shot over the dimension. You got too many things there. All right. Yeah, no problem. My linear algebra is rusty too sometimes. Okay. So it's linearly dependent. In particular, what's the good news? We may find f of x, I better not use f again, old habit. We may find g of x in fx such that g of alpha equals zero. And why do I claim that is so immediate? Because that set is linearly independent, you know you can find a c0 plus c1 alpha plus all the way up to cn alpha to the n where that relation is zero. And so basically you're turning your linear dependence relation into the polynomial. You take C0 plus C1X plus all the way to CNX to the N. So dependence relations are our beautiful linear algebraic trick to constructing polynomials that have a particular root. All right, moreover, as I just said, let's say we have um, a finite dimensional uh, F vector space K, which is also a field. And let's say alpha belongs to K. Then as we noted, we can find a polynomial which has it as a root. Okay, and I'll abuse notation a little bit for now. F isn't my original polynomial. It's just a polynomial for the sake of making a remark. I'll, maybe I'll change it to G so I'll sleep tonight. I can find G of X, which has alpha as a root because that's what I just said. So let's take one of minimal degree. Then just, just, just like before, you can show that the dimension of F adjoin alpha over F is equal to the degree of that polynomial G of X. And so remember the idea of this step was generalize a little bit. We saw this for C adjoin alpha. We saw in an example, this worked for Q adjoin alpha. Nothing special about Q and C. This is just a field thing that holds in general. All right, so for these very special fields, you can compute their dimension by looking at a small pol the smallest polynomial having alpha as a root. So you turn the linear algebra game into a polynomial game. So now we can go to step five. 
we motivated that we sure do care about roots of polynomials. And we mentioned that Galois automorphisms are extremely uh, useful for working with roots of polynomials. And so step five is to introduce a really simplified version of subgroup and fixed fields. All right, and I'll just do it for the only kind of group we care about, collections of Galois automorphisms of K over F. We say H is a subgroup of G, and here, just to be clear, H here is a subset of G. All right, we say a subset H is a subgroup if it is closed up under function composition. If phi and psi are in H, then so is their composition. And remember, Galois automorphisms of Automorphisms, pardon me, are always invertible. And so we insist that if phi is in H, then so is its inverse. So that's what we mean by subgroup. All right, a subset which is closed up undertaking composition and inverses. Now, let's let H be a subgroup of G. We define fix of H, and I apologize, it's a bit messy on the screen, to just be the collection of elements in K that are totally unharmed by all of the automorphisms that happen to come from H. Fix of H is the collection of things which are fixed by everything in H. They're totally left alone. And as it turns out, fix H is a field and we call it the fixed field of H. The collection of things that are fixed by everything in H, the fixed field of H. Is this clear? Can I clarify anything for anyone in either crowd? I see Parker's nodding. That was a, an aggressive nod I could see, Parker. Thank you. Yeah, careful. Watch yourself. Whiplash is real. Okay. Beauty. Step six, and we're getting there. It's going to fall into place really quickly, really soon. I just need to talk about one more type of uh, field extension. That is field containment. For simplicity, we're just going to look at fields K and F, which contain the rational numbers Q. This is for characteristic reasons if you've taken any Galois theory. All right, so Q is contained in F and F is contained in K, and they're all using the operations from K. All right, we say F in K is normal. We say that containment or that field extension is normal if whenever F of X with coefficients over F has a root in K, then you have a root explosion. As soon as you have one root in K, then you completely factor the polynomial over F. Pardon me. Which means as soon as you have one root in K, you have them all in K. So as soon as you were able to drag out a linear term in K, the polynomial just fell apart and it completely factored. Some examples to make sure you're following along, and I hope you are, is for Q adjoin root two, this just so happens to be normal because you can show that, and it's basically using the idea uh, from uh, our example before, that if A plus B root two is a root of a rational polynomial, then A minus B root two is the other root. All right, if it's irreducible. All right, and we note that both a plus b root 2 and a minus b root 2 are in the form of things in q adjoin root 2. And so this one is normal. All right, but what about q adjoin the cube root of 2? All right, the collection of all rational polynomials evaluated at the cube root of 2. Well, first, since we're taking rational polynomials and evaluating at a real number, we see that K is contained in R. But take, for instance, G of X equals X cubed minus two. That for sure has a root in K, namely the cube root of two itself. But another root of this is the cube root of two times zeta three, where zeta three is a primitive third root of unity. All right, and all you need to know about that is that that is a complex number which is not real. E to the should it be that it completely I... factors over k? Right, we say it completely factors over f. Is it, should it be f or k? Uh, completely factor. Ah, thank you. This right here, big typo. It completely factors over k. 
Okay. Thank you very much. All Sorry, right. Quick, quick question. Yes. What, what do we mean by completely factors again? Completely factors means all the way down into nothing but linear degree one terms. Okay. So nothing left unbroken. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. All right. And so back to the example at hand, this I know is not in K because it's not even in R. It's not a real number. All right. And so we had one root, but we didn't have them all. And so this is kind of the canonical example of a not normal containment of fields. Thank you for catching that typo, clarifying, and a good question. What a day. All right. And now, quickly, because I'm keeping my eye on the time at least a little bit, all right, I'm going to steal the basis of Galois theory. I'm going to steal Galois theory's counting tricks. So let's take all of the objects we've considered before. Let's say we have Q contained in F contained in K and say k over f is a finite dimensional f vector space. Let's take g to be the collection of Galois automorphisms. Let's let h be a subgroup of g, and let's let e be the fixed field of h. That's basically everything we've introduced in the talk <laughs> included. We're using all the assumptions, all the tricks. Here are the big facts from Galois theory, and they look like cute, innocent uh, little results, but actually they're like the biggest deal in Galois theory. All right. The big facts are that the number of elements in G is equal to the degree of the extension. All right. And the number of elements in H is equal to the uh, degree or the dimension of K as an E vector space, where E is that fixed field of H. All right, and so these are big, big facts from Galois theory. And yes, Alex notes it actually does make sense. And the reason it makes sense is the Galois automorphisms are the number of ways to permute the roots. All right, and number of and roots, especially if you're looking at a simple extension of F adjoint, say one alpha, you're exactly taking the degree of the polynomial. But how many, what's the degree of a polynomial? The number of roots it has. And so there's connections here where you start to believe it. Permuting roots, root counting, you get Galois theory. But we'll take these as facts. All right, and a little bit of CeeLo theory. So one more step, step eight. But again, just the basics of CeeLo theory, not CeeLo, uh, not uh, silo, pardon me, CeeLo theory. All right, so say G is a collection of Galois automorphisms. And let's say it has order two to the J times M where M is odd. So that is factor all the twos out you can, please. Then G has a subgroup of order two to the J, the two part. And if, uh, ah, so they just proved this in uh, 347, which I'm guessing is a, uh, a group theory course. It's also the code for group theory at Waterloo. And so now I'm suspicious, but anyways, I digress. Um, the second fact is that if G has order two to the J, then G has a subgroup of order two to the J minus one. I call this like the, uh, the stepping stone fact. If you have a group of prime, I'd say a Galois automorphism collection of, uh, uh, order two to the J, you can always find subgroups of the next power down and you can just keep going and going and going. Counting tricks from group theory. But again, we don't talk about what a group is. We're just looking at G being the Galois collection. Okay, and I promised you we'd get back to the proof. Are there any questions? I just thought I saw a hand go up. I think Parker maybe was just stretching. There can be questions. All right. So now, because I want to make sure I actually get through the proof, I'm going to go maybe a little bit faster, but I'm going to try my uh, my very best. All right, so what do we have? We're back to the proof. We did a whole bunch of buildup. Now we're back to the proof. We have our alpha, which is the root of F, and the dimension of C adjoint alpha over C is just the degree of that F. And F has, like I said, alpha as a root, and F has the miraculous property that it has no complex roots. It's our contradiction setup for the fundamental theorem of algebra. Now, 
Let's let K be a very special field. Let's let it be a field containing R so that F of X times X squared plus one completely factors over R. Let's let K be a field containing R, ignore the word smallest if you want, such that F of X times X squared plus one completely factors over R. Here's what you need to know. First of all, K exists. You can actually do this. All right. Um, uh, exactly in the comments, you would take R adjoin the roots of F and adjoin I. That would do the trick if you know the abstract algebra. You need to know that K over R is normal. Once you have one root, you have them all. And why did I randomly include the weird X squared plus one? Why did I stick that on the side of F of X? To get the magical property that R is contained in C, but now C is contained in K. That's what I wanted to happen. I wanted to make sure I had K properly containing C, not just being a subset potentially of C. I want it to contain all of C. So what does K do? K contains all the roots of F and K contains the complex numbers because we trapped I in it using X squared plus one. Okay, now, here we go. We start with the collection of Galois automorphisms of K over R. Using our Galois theory fact and our multiplicative dimension fact, the size of G is the dimension of K over R, which is the dimension of K over C times the dimension of C over R, but the dimension of C over R is two. The basis is one and I. Every complex number is uniquely written as A plus B I. One and I are the basis. So we have two times the dimension of K over C. And so what do we have? We have that the size of G is two to the J times M where M is odd, where J is at least one because I've just proved that there's at least one factor of two. Okay. Now we use our CELO fact. Let's take our subgroup H with order two to the J and take its fixed field E. Then by our fact, the size of H is the degree of the extension K over E, but our CELO fact told us that H is exactly uh, of order two to the J. And so what does that tell me? If K over E has size two to the J, and K over R has dimension uh, two to the J times M, then the leftover part by multiplicativity has dimension M. We have the two to the J part and we have the M part, the leftovers. And we know, sorry, question? Oh, there's just some people in the hall. You're hearing cross noise oh, from the hall. No problem. And so M is odd. The degree of E over R is odd. And that all came from two to the J times M being the original degree of the extension. All right. And us being able to find part of the extension that has uh, dimension two to the J. And so what we do is we take any old beta in E and we take a polynomial G of X of minimal degree having beta as a root. Earlier, we talked about why this exists and why it must be irreducible by minimality. Similar to before, the dimension of R adjoined beta over R is exactly the degree of G of X. But since beta is in E, R adjoined beta is a subset of E. And so this dimension must divide M. It must divide M. M being odd, this also has to be odd. But now here's where the calculus comes in. Let me put a big red star. That's not red. Here's where we steal our calculus. G of X is an irreducible real polynomial. But we said before, and it has odd degree, but every real polynomial of odd degree has a root. And so the only way it can be irreducible is if it was actually degree one to start with. It's irreducible, but it also has to have a root. The only way those two things can happen at the same time 
is if your polynomial is just degree one. All right, because you can always factor out x minus beta. And so what does that tell me? That tells me that beta being a root of something like x minus r, it equals r, and so it's a real number. And so what did we just prove? Anything in E is secretly in R. And if I go back to the previous page, the dimension of E over R was M. And if E actually equals R, that tells me this has to be one. R is one dimensional over itself. Um, Ethan's question, this doesn't quite require that uh, finite extensions are simple because what we did is we just went uh, to R adjoin beta and that still has to be odd. Okay, and we're almost done because now in our last four minutes, at this point we have the dimension of K over R is two to the J because the M went away because it was one. All right, and now doing the uh, kind of the uh, using that multiplicative dimension result just once more, we have that the degree of k over r is twice times the dimension of k over c, and we have that k doesn't equal c because it contains alpha, the root of the polynomial, which has no complex root, so it's not complex. And so, pardon me, what happens? is that we must have j at least two because we have the dimension of k over c is not one because they're not the same. k is not equal to c. It contains alpha and c does not. And so what we see then is that uh, we have k over r has a uh, dimension two to the j. And so k over c has dimension two to the j minus one. I just divided both sides by that two. And so here's what I do. I take the Galois collection of now K over C and I call that G tilde. No longer K over R, which I started with. Now I wanna do K over C. And I let H tilde be a subgroup of order two to the J minus one, sorry, two to the J minus two. The very next step down, my CeeLo fact allows me to do this. And on the very last slide, we finish it up because if we let F be the fixed field of H tilde, then we know the degree of K over F is the size of H tilde, which is two to the J minus two. But then I will leave you to do just the multiplication once again. It turns out this means that the degree or the dimension of F over C is equal to two. Don't forget to breathe. Are you breathing? I know it got heavy there in the last 30 seconds. I claim we're done. I got at least one person breathing. There's vital signs. Why is this a contradiction? We have just constructed a field, which is two-dimensional over C. The dimension of F as a C vector space is two. And why can't that help? Why can't that happen? Take some beta in F. Let me write this. Take some, let me try again. Take some beta in F where beta is not in C. The only option for the degree of uh, C adjoin beta over uh, F Uh, sorry, over C, let me try that again, is for that to equal two. We know by our fact about dimensions, it had to divide two. And because beta is not in C, it's not one. And so it has to be two. Those are the only two positive divisors of two. But that means there exists an irreducible G of X in CX such that G of beta is two and the degree of g of x, sorry, g of beta is zero, pardon me. So we've just reduced it to the quadratic case, right? We reduced it to the quadratic case. 
And the reason we cannot have an irreducible polynomial in the, over the complex numbers of degree two is because we have the quadratic formula. We have a formula that writes down the roots for goodness sakes. And so this is a contradiction to the very quadratic formula. And so our construction that resulted in a degree two of extension must be impossible. That is a contradiction. Modulo, a few-ish counting tricks from abstract algebra. That is the proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, so we have a bit of a tradition here. I'm going to post something in the chat before we get into... Um, oh, now my mouse doesn't work. Um, so the tradition is that we fill out the feedback thing before we're getting into a question period. This gives our speaker a moment to, to breathe. All right. Oh, that's not a link. Uh, but more importantly, for the people in the room, if you want snacks next week, which is great, snacks and coffee and stuff, we have to fill out this form. Um, so we need people in the room, we need names and emails. For the people online, we need that seminar feedback thing. And then we'll take break. Uh, we'll take questions for both. In the meantime, we'll just eat our online snacks over here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that Good seminar. Uh, I, I did Galois theory as a reading course many, many moons ago. Mm. And hearing this talk makes me feel like I'm like 19 or 20 or something. All right. I'm glad I could Bring do that. Back. A little lizard brain. Mm. Uh, Galois theory is a course I often teach here at Waterloo. And this lecture is always the thing I do on the very last lecture as like the fun, spicy kind of topic that isn't super core to Galois theory itself, but it's kind of impressive that you have it. And for them, it's very quick because I don't have to do 90% of the buildup I did in this talk because we just had a whole course in Galois in theory. Yes. And so you can give a nice like uh, 20 minute proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Sweet. That's super duper sweet. Uh, we have one person here. I'm just curious if they made it. Someone from Spain, from someone from Zargo Zarzoga. Did they make it today? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just checking if the online person from Spain made it. I don't see them. Interesting. Anyway, your, your, your talk like had a big draw. People, people found it on research seminars and wanted to like come and check it out. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. I hope uh, I hope I didn't let anyone down. Are there any? Oh, sorry, is it too early for me to ask for uh, questions? Oh yeah, sorry. Go for questions. 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 Yeah. Questions. Go for it. Instructor habit of me. Can I answer any questions? Can I help you out? Can you go over uh, how? I think it was when we were constructing E, like the fixed field of H. Yeah. Uh, how that was. How we concluded that it it must have uh just be one for m absolutely so here we have the degree of e over r is m and it's odd and so to explain this to you you just need to know that e over r has a uh, odd dimension okay now what sorry, i did sorry i just disconnected uh for a second could you repeat uh maybe like yeah. the last five seconds of what you just said all right what I need you to know is that the dimension of E is an R vector space is M and that is odd. It's an odd number. Okay, so here's what I do. I start by taking a beta in E, any old thing in E. All right, and uh, maybe I should also, uh, or I can, uh, let, me, let, let me do this anyways. Let's take G of X in R of X to be of, minimal degree such that g of beta is zero. And earlier in the talk, we used linear dependence to justify that we could always find such a polynomial. And it has to be irreducible. But maybe this part is confusing you. Look at E over R. That uh, dimension is the same as E over R adjoined beta times the dimension of R adjoined beta over R. And remember, this was equal to M, which was that odd number. 
And so that means this puzzle piece has to be odd as well. Because if it was even, M would be even, but it's not. And the okay, reason... so yeah, it's not irreducible then. Okay. Well, it is irreducible, but the own by calculus, the only way it can oh, be yeah. irreducible is if it has degree one, because you can always find a root. And the yeah. only polynomials that are irreducible but have roots are the uh, the linear ones. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Online, in person? Um, oh, oh, sorry. Did someone else want to go first? No, go ahead, man. You're good. Yeah, do okay. it. Alex. So, so this is really cool. Um, the fact that you were able to prove like such a like a theorem that's otherwise like uses a lot of other fields of math just using Galois theory. Are there any other theorems that have like like famous theorems that have alternate proofs using Galois theory? Because I'd be really interested to know like what other like famous theorems that that don't have like algebraic proofs that do have mostly algebraic that that usually aren't proved using algebra but that do have alternate proofs uh using galois theory galois theory specifically huh yeah hmm i'm think not that i can think of off the top of my head the answer is almost surely yes because math is cute like that but uh None more famous than this one, I would say. Like, uh, I cannot think of a proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus, for, for instance, uh, using Galois theory. Uh, so none that I know of, but they must be there because uh, math works in clever ways. So that's my bad, true answer to your question. Okay, that's fair. New challenge, prove the generalized Stokes' theorem using Galois yeah, theory. Yeah, we'll go for it. Prove the completeness of the real line using Galois theory. Other questions, please. If there's no other questions, we'll give you another round of applause. That was awesome. Sweet. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week. We're going to have a speaker. Sarah Brewer, she's going to tell us about making cool patterns uh, using GeoGebra, I think. So like Islamic geometry via GeoGebra, uh, which is going to be sweet. Uh, because you signed up for the forum with the snacks, for the first time, you will have snacks. It's very exciting. Uh, so there'll be coffee and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so once again, thank you, Blake. It's great to see you. Uh, online people, we hope to see you back next week. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Enjoy your term.